right, so tonight's lecture, as I said, is reversing diseases naturally. This is actually two lectures. I'm going to squeeze it into one tonight uh, because we have some other things that we're going to be going over tomorrow morning um, for our Sabbath worship. Now, I'd like to uh, start with this statement from Volume 7 of the Testimonies for the Church, page 62. And uh, Ellen White writes, We have come to a time when every member of the church, how many? Every me that means all of us here, everybody in this room, all of us, everywhere, all the members of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. The world is a Lazar house filled with victims of both physical and spiritual disease. Everywhere people are perishing for lack of a knowledge of the truths that have been committed to us. The members of the church are in need of an awakening that they may realize their responsibility to impart these truths. So God has given to us, Seventh-day Adventists, a message of health reform that we are to commit to the world, that we are to give to the world. And we are responsible before God for the light that heaven has shown upon us. And the Lord wants every member of the church, not just the doctors, not just the nurses and the practitioners. He wants every member to be involved. And Ellen White says, sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. Nine-tenths, that means 90%, think about that, nine-tenths of the diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. Wow. When I read that, I was like, wow. That means 90% of the diseases that people have today have their origin in the mind. Wow. And then she goes on to say, Perhaps some living tru home trouble is, like a canker, eating to the very soul and weakening the life forces. Remorse for sin sometimes undermines the constitution and unbalances the mind. Volume 5, The Testimonies, page 443. So uh, we have met quite a few people with cancer, and as we talk to these people, as we pray with them, as we share with them, we find out that many of them have emotional issues. Let me give you an example. We had a, a young man, age 21, come to us with stage 3 uh, osteosarcoma in the leg, which is bone cancer, it was in the knee. It was centered in the knee, and his knee was quite swollen, we were doing therapies, he, we were juicing, we were putting mud, mud poultices and charcoal poultices, and he was taking Laetril, and uh, we had a nurse that was injecting Laetril for him intravenously under the supervision of a medical doctor that we were working with, and it wasn't getting any better. Six weeks later, it was getting the, the leg, the tumor was getting bigger, and I said, oh boy, what's going on? And so we prayed, we said, Lord, what are we doing? I mean, we're doing everything right. What's going on here? And I started talking to him, and the Lord said, there's something deeper than just, you know, bad diet, eating flesh foods, backsliding from God, drinking Coca-Cola. There's something more. Good evening. Happy Sabbath. Welcome. We just started. So there's something more than what you see on the surface. There's something deeper here. And so I began talking to the young man. Well, come to find out, he was in a deep state of depression because his mother left him when he was a young child. <clears throat> and she went to Saudi Arabia and was working there to support the family in the Philippines. And he felt a lot of emotional pain. He felt abandoned because of that. And uh, although he had attended some evangelistic meetings put on by Seventh-day Adventists, had accepted the Sabbath, and was turning his life over to God, he became a backslider. And he started eating lots of flesh foods and drinking a large bottle of Coca-Cola every day. That's like 15, 20 tablespoons of sugar for the big size every day. And uh, he developed cancer. But the root of his cancer was in the mind. And so I told him, you know, brother, you've, why don't we pray? And, and I want you to open your heart and ask Jesus to come in and heal your pain. Because God can heal your pain. It's not that your mother doesn't love you. She saw the necessity of leaving the country to support the family because there's no jobs. You see. So, make a long story short, um, the young man had to have his leg taken off. 
uh, before the cancer would metastasize to the rest of the body. Um, and uh, we had a surgeon come up to the house. That's what he recommended. I encouraged the young boy. I said, you know, it's probably a good idea. He said, no, I don't want to have my leg taken off. And I said, well, I can sympathize with you. I understand. But if you don't take your leg off, your time is going to be very short because the cancer is growing. And, and so make a long story short, he did have the surgery. And he did go home. And he lived another year. Uh, I'm sorry. He lived a year and a half before he died. But he died at home, happy, and with his family. Praise the Lord for that. So, again, she says, perhaps some living home trouble is like a canker eating to the very soul and weakening the life forces. And I believe the root of his cancer was the emotional pain that he experienced as being abandoned by his mother. So that's the way he viewed it. There are many ways of practicing the healing art, but there is only one way that heaven approves. God's remedies are the simple agencies of nature that will not tax or debilitate the system through their powerful properties. Five Testimonies, page 443, and Councils and Diet and Foods, page 301. And then she goes on and writes, Pure air and water, cleanliness, a proper diet, purity of life, and a firm trust in God are remedies for the want of which thousands are dying. Yet these remedies are going out of date because their skillful use requires what? Work that the people do not appreciate. You know, how, how many of you have given hydrotherapy treatments to somebody who is sick? That's a lot of work, especially people who are in pain. Oh, boy. Sometimes you have to do three cycles. It can take you over an hour, and it's very strenuous work. And then we had a cancer patient years ago, <coughs> a friend of mine, actually. He had stage four brain cancer, and uh, he was a dying man. We brought him out of the hospital. He came to our place, and we were doing all kinds of therapies, and, and he would be free of pain, and then 12 hours later, he's in pain, moaning in pain again. Well, make a long story short, came to find out that this man was backslidden from God, was cheating on his wife, was backsliding in his diet, was eating flesh foods, and blaming God for his cancer. But in reality, his cancer was the result of his wrong choices. You see? And so, skillful use, a lot of work. Fresh air, Exercise, pure water, and clean, sweet premises are within the reach of all with but little expense. But drugs are expensive, both in the outlay of means and the effect produced upon the system. Now, let's talk about drugs for just a minute. Ellen White, in the book Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 450, writes this. Drugs never cure disease. Is that true? True or false? That's true. Let me give you an example. If you have high blood pressure and you are taking lo losartan, which is a medication that will lower your blood pressure, and uh, your blood pressure is normal, and then one day you forget to take your medication, what happens to your blood pressure? It goes right up. It goes through the roof, right? It'll go back up to 160, 170, 180, over 100, or 120, or whatever. So did the medication cure the disease? No, it manipulated the symptoms of the disease. But it didn't cure the disease, did it? You still have heart disease, right? The same thing with insulin. If you don't take your insulin shot, what happens to your blood sugar? It goes right back up. Did it cure your disease? No, it only controlled the symptoms of the diabetes. So again, drugs never cure disease. They only change the form and location. Nature alone is the effectual restorer. And how much better could she perform her task if left to herself? But this privilege is seldom allowed her. Now, if you have an infection, let's say you have an infection in the lungs, you have an infection in the blood, and you take antibiotics, will that help you? Absolutely. In fact, years ago, I got an infection in my leg, and it was a staph infection from polluted water. Okay, It was dirty water from the well on our property, and, and I got some water on there, and I rinsed it off, and I didn't realize the water was had some bacteria in it, and, and it got infected. I did everything natural. In fact, I was fasting for days on water and pleading with the Lord. I was putting poultices, and I was putting herbs, and I was putting everything, and I was calling my friends. They said, Brother, you better take the antibiotics or you're going to lose your leg. I said, Yeah, but, yeah, okay. So I went to the doctor, and he said, Oh, let me see your leg. And he was kind of a gruff guy, you know, and I was like, Uh-oh, he's going to yell at me. I just know he is. He said, Let me see that. And I pulled up my leg. He said, Oh, oh. He said, I'm going to have to 
I'm going to have to clean that out. I said, oh, uh, uh, okay, so can you just go ahead and clean it? Oh, no, no, I have to admit you first. We've got to put you on intravenous antibiotics. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. Uh, I don't think I'm ready for that. No, 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 no. He says, you have to be admitted. And so I called my wife and said, honey, you need to come down here right now. This is in the small town where I live in the Philippines. So he admitted me, make a long story short. They cut on my leg for two hours. And I was screaming in excruciating pain under sedation, mind you. Yeah. And uh, they cleaned it out. And, you know, I took the antibiotics. And make a long story short, I recovered. And I still have my leg. Isn't that wonderful? It's still attached. <laughs> but... You know, that's the blessing. I'm still walking around and sharing the gospel. But I took drugs, not for a disease, but for an infection. That's different. It's not a disease, right? So antibiotics can help us. And when you get in an accident, like my brother just did, pretty sad situation. He lost his leg in a motorcycle accident. He's in recovery. He's doing well. Um, has a positive outlook. Getting ready for the prosthetic leg and probably in January. And, uh, but he had to be in ICU on all kinds of medications and painkillers. And, you know, we need that. But what we're talking about is diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, autoimmune diseases, cancer. Okay? Did you know that in this country alone, from 2010 to 2018, it is projected that we will have spent approximately $535 billion in pharmaceutical medications. Another estimate says approximately $360 billion in pharmaceutical medications in the United States alone in only eight years. This is big, big money, big, big business. And cholesterol-lowering drugs are the number one prescribed medications. And why is that? Because people's arteries are clogged up from the flesh foods and the dairy products and the processed foods that they're eating on a daily basis. Beta blockers, high blood pressure medications for heart disease, 26.4% of the medications prescribed. Diuretics for high blood pressure, heart disease, again, all for heart disease. And then we go on cholesterol-lowering drugs, and etc. Okay? These are the medications. So we spend billions of dollars on medications. And what does God say about medications? He says, as to drugs being used in our institutions, it is contrary to the light which the Lord has been pleased to give. The drugging business has done more harm to our world and killed more than it has helped or cured. Wow. The light was first given to me, Ellen White writes, why institutions should be established. That is, sanitariums were to do what? Were to reform the medical practices of who? Physicians, doctors, you see. So, and this is taken from Medical Ministry, 1898 by Ellen G. White, page 27. So God designed us as Seventh-day Adventists to have sanitariums, which, if you read in other quotations, were to be built in the country where people were to be educated on the New START program, the laws of health, natural therapies were to be used, and people were to be educated about their diet and lifestyle, etc. But unfortunately, among us as Seventh-day Adventists, there are very few institutions who even come close to the model that God had given to us as a church, such as Wildwood Lifestyle Center and Hospital. And of course, they teach the New Start program and they do a lot of natural therapies. They do a lot of great things there. And Weimar does some good things too. But unfortunately, instead of following the council, we have built mammoth institutions. In fact, this is an old picture. Now they have an institution that's two times the size of that. It looks like it because it's high rise. Yeah, it's updated. It's an updated building, but anyways. But the point is, and I'm not against hospitals. We need hospitals. I've been in the hospital quite a few times in my lifetime. And even in the Philippines, I've been hospitalized a few times for dehydration and 
And uh, just before coming back to the United States, I was hospitalized for amoebiasis. Yeah, you know, from dirty water, some water, some maybe some food I ate or something, and it got into my gut, and I had diarrhea, and I got dehydrated, and I had to be on, on fluids. Fortunately, it was only for, I think, 10 hours, but still, we need hospital, right? But the sad thing is that people will go into these institutions and they will spend thousands and tens of thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars and never hear one message about health reform. That's a tragedy. We have people, not only here in the United States, even in the Philippines, patients, I see them coming out in wheelchairs and, and, and they're being picked up by the taxi and I look at them and I say, it's so sad that nobody has educated them about our health message. They only took their money and gave them drugs. We practice like the world. Now I'm not condemning doctors, I'm not saying they're bad people, I'm not saying these institutions are bad, all I'm saying is we are not following the blueprint that God gave to us as a people. And the Lord wants to help us to go forward. What is disease? Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. In case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. Unhealthful, unhealthful conditions should be changed. Wrong habits corrected. Then, nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. We read this last night, Ministry of Healing page 127. And we talked about cleansing. We talked about cleansing as a biblical principle, as we found in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And I had shared how God had restored my health because I was a drug addict, I was an alcoholic, I was a two-pack-a-day smoker when I was high on drugs, and at 23 years old, after having given my life to Christ, I was a dying man. And yet, through fasting and cleansing the body, through juice fasting, through cleaning out the liver and drinking herb teas and faith in God, the Lord restored my health. My liver was four times more toxic than the average person. I was adrenally exhausted from using meth and cocaine and all those horrible drugs. And the Lord brought me back to life. I, w I thought I was going to die at 23 years old. I really did. I could barely walk. I was, I was walking so no energy. I mean, I was so burned out. But praise God. He made a way whereby we could cleanse our body and rejuvenate our immune system. In order for us to assist nature in her effort to expel impurities, we need to open up and increase the ability of these organs to detoxify or cleanse the body. What organs? The skin, the liver, the kidneys, the lungs, and the colon. These are the organs of elimination. This is how we expel impurities from our body. And the way that we open up these channels of elimination, we found out one of the best ways is through fasting. And of course, exercise will produce sweat, and you sweat through the skin, but we also use steam baths. And we'll talk about that <coughs> in a few minutes. <coughs> Can I have the water, honey? Sure. Thank you. Notice what Ella White says in the book Ministry of Healing, page 238. And she's talking about uh, exercise here. She says, Inactivity is a fruitful cause of disease. Exercise quickens and equalizes the circulation of the blood. But in idleness, the blood does not circulate freely, and the changes in it, so necessary to life and health, do not take place. And then she says, the skin too becomes inactive. Impurities are not expelled as they would be if the circulation had been quickened by vigorous exercise. The skin kept in a healthy condition and the lungs fed with plenty of pure, fresh air. This state of the system throws a double burden on the excretory organs and disease is the result. Ministry of Healing 238. Remember, good evening, happy Sabbath. Thank you for coming. Nice to see you. 
When God put Adam and Eve into the garden, he put them in there to, he told them to dress it and to keep it, right? They were gardeners. They were farming, and the sun was shining, and it was warm, and they would sweat. And, of course, it being in the sun, the warm weather, they would be thirsty, and they would be drinking water, and they would be breathing the fresh, pure air of the Garden of Eden. How far away we have wandered from the garden and God's original plan for humanity. And so, when people get sick, we put them on a juice fast. We talked about that last night. We do a three, four day fast, sometimes five days. And then we have them eat raw foods. And while they're fasting, we also do a steam bath, which kind of mimics vigorous exercise. Because when you go jogging or you do aerobics, you really sweat, right? Well, the biggest organ of elimination that we have is the skin. But if we're not exercising, we're not sweating. And you know, it's so sad that so many people are using antiperspirants, meaning anti-sweating chemicals that we put you know, underneath our arms because we don't want to smell bad. No, I'm not saying don't use anything under your arm. But there are deodorants that are natural that don't have aluminum and other chemicals, and they don't plug the pores, but they allow you to sweat, but they cover the smell if you smell, okay? So, and that's why so many women have breast cancer because it goes right into the pores of the skin, under the arm, and right into the soft tissue of the breast. And of course that, along with the wrong eating habits and etc., that's why we have so much breast cancer. But nevertheless, by sweating, we're allowing the toxins to come out through the skin. This man uh, was a drinker and he was a heavy smoker and he failed his phys physical examination as a bus driver in Manila. His sister, who is Seventh-day Adventist, brought him to us for a 10-day detox program. We put him on juice fasting. I don't remember if we were doing coffee enemas with him. Do you remember? I don't think so at the time. But we were doing a, we did a steam bath, and then I put him in a wet sheet pack. After the steam bath, he sweat for 30 minutes. Then we took him out. We put him in an ice-cold sheet and wrapped him up and covered him with blankets and let him sweat in there for another hour. And you could see the stuff coming out of his skin into the sheet. And that man, at the end of 10 days, was a non-smoker. And his blood pressure went down to normal. He went back to work within a month. He passed the physical. His blood pressure was normal. He wasn't on any medications. He had changed his lifestyle, and he went back to work. Praise the Lord. You see. While medical treatments aim at reducing the symptoms and may address some discrete areas of disease, they do little or nothing to remove the underlying illness or stop its progression to an untimely death. On the other hand, fasting treats the entire body. We read about fasting last night. Paul Bragg mentions that fasting uh, assists the body to flush out the causes of body miseries. It is mentioned 74 times in the Bible. We know that rejuvenation can take place even within a week of juice fasting, like this person who has advanced diabetes and neuropathy in the lower extremities, as you see here. And this is day number one, open ulcers and sores, and day number seven, completely healed. Uh, absolutely amazing. We shared this lady's testimony, how she got off her high blood pressure medications. Her blood pressure went from, I think it was 160 over 89, down to 112 over 78 in only five days. In fact, the blood pressure dropped to normal by the third day of fasting without medication. So I'll skip that. We showed that last night. So we encourage people to eat more raw foods. We need to eat good food. We need to feed our body live enzymes, fruits, salads. Okay. So we're going to talk tonight a little bit deeper about detoxifying. Remember, the skin, the largest organ of elimination, exercise, steam bath, sweating, uh, that's one of the ways that we can detoxify and cleanse the body. And also we need to cleanse the liver. You see, the liver is so important because it removes a plethora of toxic waste from our circulation, such as drugs, bacteria, fungi, viruses, parasites, food additives, pesticides and herbicides, chemicals, fats, alcohol, dead cells, and other debris. The liver purifies the blood. Before its journey throughout the human body, blood from the stomach and intestines is filtered by the liver. To prevent contaminants from circulating in the bloodstream, the liver removes these toxic things 
from our circulation. We just read the list. Housing an ingenious clean, clean, cleaning system, the liver detoxifies infectious organisms, alcohol, heavy metals, drugs, chemicals, toxic byproducts, and other poisons from the blood. Without this function, the human body would suffer from a fatal level of pollution. The liver produces bile. This is regarding digestion, a substance needed to digest and absorb fats. Bile aids the digestion by helping the body absorb fat and it's absorb uh, and certain vitamins, including vitamins A, D, E, and K. In addition, the liver converts the food we eat into nutrients the body can use. The liver manufactures a variety of important proteins, including enzymes, hormones, blood proteins, clotting factors, and what? Immune factors. The liver also produces cholesterol, that's good cholesterol, which carries energy supplying fats around the body and is a building block for hormones to regulate metabolism and growth. Everyone's health and longevity depend on the liver's ability to manufacture proteins. The liver processes almost everything that we ingest via our mouth, breathe into our lungs, or absorb through our skin. Considered to be the biochemical factory of the body, the liver metabolizes substances in the bloodstream. So, let's talk about liver and gallbladder health. What are the foods that we should avoid so that our liver will not be overburdened with toxic waste? Fried foods, hydrogenated oils, and by the way, most of the chips that we eat in those nice packages in the grocery store have hydrogenated oils in them, and so does peanut butter. Flesh foods, not all peanut butter, most of it. Flesh foods, packaged meats, Canned meats, dairy products, sugar, high fat meals, these are all very damaging to the liver and the gallbladder. What are the beneficial herbs and enzymes? Digestive enzymes, dandelion root is a great herb for cleansing the liver along with milk thistle, turmeric, they call that luya dilao in Tagalog in the Philippines and it grows everywhere, it's so cheap. You can get a whole bunch of that stuff for really cheap and we use it with cancer patients. Barberry, these are all good herbs for the liver. What are some of the juices for detoxifying and cleansing the liver? Sugar beets, number one. That's the best. But don't drink too much pure sugar beet juice. It's very, very, very powerful stuff. So I would drink about a half a glass, okay? About four ounces at the most. Celery, parsley, grapefruit, and turmeric. Again, the yellow ginger. You can also do a liver cleanse. Uh, you mix in a blender four ounces of fresh apple juice with four ounces of water three cloves of garlic and a half inch piece of ginger, three tablespoons of olive oil, you blend it thoroughly, you strain it, and you drink this to stimulate bile to flow from the liver and gallbladder. After three days of juice fasting on mostly apple juice and other juices, you can mix four ounces of extra virgin cold pressed olive oil with four ounces of pure lemon juice. You can drink before bed and lay on your right side in the fetal position for 30 minutes. And what will happen is the gallstones that have accumulated in the gallbladder, if you have gallstones, uh, the, the bile duct will dilate. This will open up. The body will detect an overabundance of fat in that olive oil, which is four ounces. That's half a cup. And it will say, uh-oh, we have an emergency here. We need to get lots of bile in order to break this down. And so this bile duct will dilate and the bile, along with the stones that have been hiding up in there, will flow out into the duodenum and down into the small intestine and to the large intestine for elimination the following day. And we will have gallstones come out like this man. And as Pastor was saying, um, a lot of times uh, these gallstone-looking items are a result of saponification, which is the oil and the lemon along with the bile that's from the gallbladder, it will put it in these globules and you'll have these things come out. And the way to tell if they're actually stones is to soak them in water. And then if it just dissolves, then that's not really gallstones, that's just the result of what you drank. But in many cases, like in, I'm sure in this man's case, because he was scheduled for gallbladder surgery, if we had soaked these stones, we would see these hard crystalline type rocks made of different things, sometimes cholesterol, uh, bile salts, and other things. I don't know exactly what they're made of, but there's different kinds. So nevertheless, uh, he did have stones, and he was cleared by the doctor, and he didn't need surgery. All right, 
So what's another way that we can cleanse the liver? Well, we take what's called coffee enemas. Now, I know that sounds bizarre, and people say, coffee enemas? You mean you're going to put coffee in your rectum and into your intestine? The answer is yes. Now, the reason why we're going to do that, there are two things that coffee enemas are good for. Number one, for detoxifying and cleansing the liver, because what happens is that when you put coffee into the intestine, it's absorbed through the portal vein, goes into the liver, and the liver, those bile ducts in the liver dilate, they open up, and the toxins that are in, that are in the fatty tissues of the liver will go back through the, uh, uh, the, the blood, blood system down into the intestine. It will be deposited back in there, and uh, that will clean out your liver. That's the only way that I know of that is so effective to detoxify the liver. In fact, we had a man years ago who was uh, working in the Middle East, and he was sent home to the Philippines because he failed his examination because he tested positive for hepatitis B. And so the doctor sent him home, and he lost his job, and he's a professional. He's an engineer. He works on high-rise buildings. And so he came to us for help, drived up in a brand-new car, and he said, Brother James, I need help. Can you help me? I said, okay, look. I said, first of all, I don't heal anybody. Only God can do that. But if you believe in God, we do a program that God has given to us, and we can pray that the Lord will heal you. And he said, okay, I'm ready. Can we start tomorrow? And my wife and I looked at each other, and I was like, uh, because we were scheduled to leave coming back to the United States a week after he arrived at my front door. And so we decided to reschedule our flights so that we could help this man before leaving the country. So we did that. He came. Uh, he did coffee enemas every day that he was there. We put him on juice fasting, steam bath, raw foods, exercise, sunshine, fresh air, lots of water, and colon cleansing and massage. And at the end of 10 days, he said he was feeling good. He was feeling better. We had shared so much spiritual truth with him. He was a Bible reader. And then I wrote him out a program. And in that follow-up program, I told him, I want you to do coffee enema every day for a week. And after that, I want you to do it three times a week for a whole month and then go to the doctor and find out how you're doing. A month later, I got a text message from him, and he said, Thank you, Brother James. I'm so excited. Praise the Lord. I just had a test, and I am clear of hepatitis B. I'm leaving the country today. Thank you so much. So praise God. So how do we do a coffee enema? Well, this is how we make it. We boil 32 ounces of water. We turn the stove down to low heat. We add three tablespoons of coffee grounds, organic roasted coffee beans. Don't use Folgers or three-in-one or any of that stuff, okay? Uh, three-in-one is where they put cream and sugar. You know, you don't want that, all right? So <laughs> three-in-one is sold in the Philippines. That's why you're like, three-in-one, what's that? But in the Philippines, they have these packages it's called three-in-one. But anyways, so uh, organic roasted beans. You, you boil it for about five to seven minutes on low heat. You strain it, and you pour the lukewarm mixture, of course, you've got to cool it down, into the enema bag. You infuse it into the colon, and you retain it for 13 minutes, and then you time it. As soon as all of it's in your intestine, you hold it in, and don't let it out, and then 13 minutes later, you jump on the toilet and let it all out, and that's it. It's very simple, and we have seen many cancer patients who are on a maximum amount, maximum amount of pain medication, moaning in pain, some of them crying in pain, we give them a coffee enema and their pain is gone in 15 minutes. Oh, I feel so much better. Praise the Lord. Four hours later, oh, okay, another coffee enema. Two, three times a day sometimes. Very effective. What do you think is better, taking the pain medication or giving a coffee enema? The coffee enema, of course. It's natural. It's not going to hurt them. It's going to clean out the liver. It's going to help them. Coffee enemas properly done stimulate the liver, a main organ of detoxification, to produce more bile. Bile is a bodily fluid that has a role in fat digestion and into which many toxins, both internally and externally generated, are dissolved for removal from the body out through the gallbladder, small intestine, and colon. Coffee enemas facilitate the release of toxins by causing the muscles of the bile duct to relax, opening the duct widely to produce a large flow of bile from the gallbladder 
into the small intestine where you should have a binding agent present, such as chlorophyll, to tightly bind the toxins to prevent reabsorption. And so they recommend uh, drinking green juices uh, during this process, or just before or just after. This allows the liver to rid itself of many toxins quickly, freeing it to process more blood transported toxins from throughout the body. A systemic detoxification effect and greater overall well-being results. All the blood in your body passes through the liver about every three minutes. So when you're taking this treatment, during that 13 minutes, it's like dialyzing your blood via the liver. Yeah, very powerful. In fact, it dilates the blood vessels via the effects of the coffees theophylline and theobromine, further increasing blood flow to the liver. Increasing glutathi glutathione S transferase GST production, which is a key detoxification enzyme by 600 to 700 percent via action of coffee's palmitic acid. GST shuttles toxins for binding with glutathione, which neutralizes them and carries them out of the body in the bile. And it speeds the transit of waste through the colon. And the way that it's absorbed is through the portal vein from the small intestine and the uh, all the way up into the liver. So here we have a picture of the hepatic portal vein, another diagram which kind of gives you an idea of what's going on when you do a coffee enema. Now, we have seen people with eczema, skin diseases, itchy, itchy, rashes, uh, atopic dermatitis, and whatnot, go through a fast, and when they take the coffee enemas and you clean out the liver, guess what happens to the skin? It clears out, and it goes away. And they say, this is amazing. I've been taking medications for years, the creams and all the stuff the doctors give, and I've, I've just been suffering for years. And in 10 days, we've seen these diseases reverse cleaning out the liver through fasting and doing coffee enemas as well. In fact, I was at an elders meeting in Laguna years ago, and uh, there was a young girl, this little girl here running around, and she had these open lesions in her leg. And they were sores, and some of them had pus coming out of them. And I said, oh. I looked at her, and I knew exactly what was going on. That child is liver toxic, extremely liver toxic. And so I said, little girl, where's your mommy? She said, mommy, mommy here, mommy here. So she took me to her house. Well, the lady behind me there is not actually the mother. She's the aunt, but she's taking care of the child. I don't know if her sister's out of the country working or what. But anyway, so I, I, I said, oh, hi, how are you? And, and so I was impressed by the Holy Spirit. Do not leave until you teach these people how to help this child because she's going to get cancer at a young age. Come to find out she's addicted to candy. She's always taking pesos, and, and she runs to the store, and she's eating candy all day long. I said, no, no, no. I said, don't allow the child to eat candy anymore. She's liver toxic. That's why she has these open sores, because the body, the liver is overloaded, and so it has to dump poison somewhere and somehow. So well, how do, what does the body do? It says, oh, let's take it through the skin. The blood is toxic. This stuff is coming right out of the bloodstream, right through the skin. And there you have the pus and everything, these open sores. And I said, please, for the sake of your niece, do not allow her to eat junk foods anymore. Feed her fresh fruit and vegetables and, and let her eat brown rice instead of white rice and, and let her drink water every day because she's going to get cancer at a young age. Looking at that, that's bad. I said, oh, thank you so much. And I prayed for them and then I left. Praise the Lord. This woman came to us with, did she have gallstones? Yeah, gallstones. Um, and, you know, after, a, she did a 10-day program, didn't she, honey? Yeah, she did a 10-day program. Gallstones came out, went back to work, no problem. And, of course, I showed this video last night of the woman with rheumatoid arthritis. Also, we did coffee enemas with her, and the pain subsided. In two days, the pain was almost completely gone. And it would go up and down. But by day 10, she said the pain was at about a 2 or 3, from 10, 9 or 10 to about 2 or 3. And uh, she's doing very well now. So let me, uh, okay, let's just skip that. All right, let me shift gears here. And I'll pull up the other slides for us tonight. Okay. Now, last night, we talked about colon cleansing a little bit. 
and how if our body is not eliminating two to three times a day, we're not having two to three bowel movements a day, we can get excess baggage right here, right? Like this guy. But after cleaning out the intestine, we can get rid of that old fecal material that has built up inside of the large intestine, the colon. And if you are constipated, you can have problems like diverticulitis, you can have strictures, you can have uh, all kinds of problems. This, this is how your colon can look after having disease from constipation. And in this book, we read that constipation contributes toward the lowering of body resistance, predisposing it to many acute illnesses and the creation of a great many degenerative and chronic processes. Intestinal constipation causes what? Cellular constipation. It also increases the workload of the other excretory organs, the kidneys, the skin, the liver, the lungs, and the lymphatic system. The functioning of these organs becomes depleted and overworked. Now think about it. If you eat three meals a day, the normal function of the body is you should be having three bowel movements a day, at least two. So if you eat three meals a day and there are 30 days in a month, how many meals is that? 90, right? That means you should be having 90 bowel movements a month if you're eating three times a day. But if you only go once a day, you only move your bowel once a day, and that's 30 bowel movements in a month, how many bowel movements are you lacking? 60. 60 bowel movements are not coming out. Where do you think that's going? It's stuck up inside your body, and your, your gut gets bigger and bigger, and then you, you feel sleepy all the time, and you feel so tired, and, and you have a headache, and you have lower back ache, because your liver is toxic, your kidneys are toxic, and your bloodstream is overloaded, and then you have all kinds of problems. That's what happens when our body is constipated. We're not eating enough fiber-rich food like fruits and vegetables, nuts, grains, seeds, and legumes. The cellular metabolism, due to constipation, becomes sluggish, repair and growth are delayed, and the ability to eliminate waste materials is lowered. The cells, instead of being alive and active, become dead and inactive. This is written by Dr. Bernard Jensen, and I do not espouse his religious beliefs because the, he, was, he had some really weird stuff that he believed. But as far as natural healing, he was very knowledgeable about cleansing and detoxification, and he pioneered a lot of work uh, regarding colon cleansing, and that's why I put this statement here, so I just want you to know that I don't agree with his religious views, okay? But the, the health information in this book is fantastic, and he talks about the importance of cleaning out the intestine. We talked about that last night, that one of the ways is by doing enemas and also a kalima board, which is a gravity flow type of enema where you lay down, uh, you use this board and it's over the toilet, and the, the waste materials will go into the toilet, and so uh, that's another way of cleansing out the colon. And then you can go to a clinic that has a machine called a colonic machine, and it puts pressure, it's actually water under pressure, and they regulate the pressure, and they, they push the water into the intestine, and then the, the fecal material comes out in this tube, and they have it lit up so that you can see the worms and the parasites and all the ugly stuff coming out of your intestine. And they put that there because they want the patient to see what they're paying for. You get your money's worth. All right, so let's talk about the kidneys now. Our kidneys have many responsibilities, which include cleansing our blood by filtering out excess water and unwanted waste from the bloodstream. These organs also help regulate blood pressure, maintain healthy electrolyte levels, and produce red blood cells. A healthy diet, regular exercise, we've talked extensively about those two things, haven't we? And proper hydration, we talked about that as well, are elemental in maintaining healthy kidneys. The reality is that most of us fail to exercise regularly or eat mostly healthy foods. There are some natural herbs available that will help cleanse your kidneys and support optimum kidney function. The following are eight herbs that promote kidney health. Number one is juniper berries. The small juniper berry is highly regarded as a blood purifying kidney tonic, one of the strongest and best of all of our natural substances to cleanse 
and strengthen the kidneys. Goldenrod has been used by Native American tribes, and studies have shown that this herb helps to detoxify the kidneys while promoting overall urinary tract health. <coughs> Hydrangea root is another herb that was popular among Native American tribes, and early American settlers uh, was the hydrangea root. This plant helps the body efficiently use calcium, which is the main component of, component of 80% of kidney stones. Dandelion root, one of the best. Typically, uh, they have a neg negative con connotation because of their common weed status in many yards. However, the dandelion root can help the body maintain healthy fluid levels and eliminate waste. Parsley, also very good. You can juice that. It's rich in antioxidants and so on. Marshmallow root will also increase urination. It's a diuretic. It helps to uh, soothe the tissues found in the urinary tract system. Gravel root. It also has a history of being used in Native American tribes, and of course settlers use that herb to maintain kidney health and uh, healthy urinary tract systems. Corn silk, you know, the, uh, they call it in Tagalog, buhuk ng mais, meaning the hair of the corn, okay? And you take that hair that comes out of the corn, you know, and you boil it, and you drink the tea, and that's very good for cleansing the kidneys and the urinary tract as well. All right, these five drinks, can help detoxify your body and treat your entire kidneys uh, very easily. Number one is cranberry juice. Okay, this juice is naturally effective and a great method to cure your entire kidney problem. It also helps in treating your urinary area by combating with urinary tract infections and eliminates bacteria that amasses in the bladder and urethra. So, uh, um, the uh, uh, cranberry juice can be found in your local grocery store this is the brand that I use. In the Philippines, it's quite expensive because it's imported from the United States, but we still use it in treating patients who have UTI infections or kidney problems, along with an herb tea that has all the kidney herbs in one formula. We use that. Beet juice, again, very good. Uh, we know that it's quite popular as a liver detoxification juice. However, it is also good for cleansing the kidneys. Uh, it consists of betaine, anti-cancer and antioxidant properties that amplify the tartness of urine, which helps to abolish calcium phosphate that amasses in the kidneys. One thing to keep in mind while you're consuming beet juice is to ensure that you don't overdrink it. Consult your nutritionist to find out the right quantity, and I recommend only four ounces, maybe twice a day at the most, okay? And space it out over three or four hours because it's very potent stuff, very, very powerful medicine. Lemon juice also enhances the level of citrate in the urine, which in turn helps to prevent kidney stones. But only use four to five lemons in one liter of water and drink this liquid remedy once in a day. It is also better to squeeze some lemon juice into a cup of warm water and drink it in the morning on an empty stomach. This is what we do usually. My wife is faith more faithful at that than I am. And uh, you can even sprinkle some cayenne pepper in there because it's very good for circulating the blood and detoxifying the body, so very good. Some of the juices that you can make uh, for cleansing the kidneys uh, would be a mixture of all the various green vegetables. Green vegetables contain loads of antioxidant elements and they help in removing the toxins from the body, which indirectly cleanses your kidneys. You can make these juices of different vegetables, including celery, cucumber, zucchini, carrot, cabbage, kale, and lettuce. So the green juices are the best, and of course beet juice is good for that as well, and they can cleanse our kidneys. Again, watermelon juice, we know is composed, watermelon is 92% water, and it can help to eradicate sand from the kidneys. It, can, it is also rich in, uh, in potassium, which helps to melt the kidney stones and gravel as well. And if you have kidney stones, definitely you should do a three to five day juice fast using these herbs and teas and juices that we have just been going over. Like we said earlier, kidney cleansing is vital to remove the toxins from the body. So make sure that you drink any or all of these five drinks to purify your kidneys and also ensure that you prevent any kind of kidney problems. Very important, kidney cleansing for health. Okay, so, um, so these are some of the main organs of detoxification. This is how we cleanse the body. Now, 
A lot of people will do just juice fasting, and that's good, but we like to also detoxify the specific organs. So we have herb teas that we use for cleansing the liver, herb teas for the bloodstream, herb teas for the kidneys and urinary tract. And um, I thought I would also mention for urinary tract infections, uh, colloidal silver, which you can get in your local health food store in some of them, not all of them. Colloidal silver is also very good uh, for urinary tract infections, and we have used it. In fact, my wife had UTI one time. She wasn't drinking enough water, and uh, she got a urinary tract infection, uh, and we happened to be in a, a place where we were distributing 10,000 pieces of literature in Alangapo City, and a friend of ours who is a medical doctor who also practices natural healing and does not prescribe medications to his patients and has been doing so for many, many years, but he's a licensed medical doctor in the Philippines. <coughs> he, uh, he said, oh, colloidal silver, get rid of it. One or two days, it's finished. I said, oh, praise the Lord. So he gave us a bottle of that, and my wife is taking several tablespoons a day, and within two days, all urinary tract infection was completely gone. Absolutely amazing. And when she had the urine test, the bacteria was too many to be counted. That's how bad the, urinary, the UTI was. It was really bad. And she had pain in the, she was like, oh, it's painful. I said, oh, let's take this. And, and sure enough, it came out clear. Two days, completely gone. Absolutely amazing. So again, if we had access to all of these other things, we could have used these things as well. And it would have really helped. So definitely very effective. Uh, I'll just put our contact information up here for those who are watching online. Um, and if you have any questions at this time, uh, we can also address your questions. And uh, before we close, I do want to read something from the Bible. <coughs> this is found in Psalms 103, and this is in verse 1 through 3. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Verse 3, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities who healeth all thy diseases. So God made a promise that he will heal all of our diseases, but what's our part? We need to be forgiven. How do we get forgiven? We ask, we confess our sins to the Lord. God forgives us. So you see, turning away from sin, confessing sin, is connected with healing because God is the source of all healing. Okay? We know that Satan can heal people, and he counterfeits what God does, but we know that if we're following the Lord's principles, God is the author of healing, and he can restore our health. If we are willing and obedient, God will work in our behalf. You see, if we pray, Lord, I have, I have kidney disease, I have liver toxicity, I have high blood pressure, and you keep drinking Coca-Cola and going to McDonald's, do you think God is going to answer your prayer? Absolutely not, because you are doing the very things that created those diseases in the first place. You haven't turned away from those practices, and how can the Lord answer your prayer? Because it's going against his principles. So if we cooperate with the Lord, God will work in miraculous ways to heal us, but we need to apply the simple things of nature, the simple agencies of nature, and we can see amazing things happen. So... Um, at this time, we will look and see if we have some questions online, um, or if you have any questions here. Um, Pastor Harold, here's a microphone. And uh, Okay, you got a question? Can you read it, my love? Let me see. I don't know if I'm... I don't know if my cellular data is turned on here. Can you read it again, my love? What's the... Uh, okay. Oh, no. Oh. Uh-oh. I'm going to turn on volume on this. Oh, what causes cherry angiomas? I'm not sure what that is. Do you know what that is, Harold? Oh, really? Okay. 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 So is that genetic? 
I don't know. I'm okay. So, yeah, we don't really have a specific answer for that, but that's a good question. Thank you for answering, uh, asking, Nick. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions here. No other questions? Okay. Well, uh, do we have any questions or comments from our brothers and sisters who are attending tonight? Anybody? Yes, Brother Gene. Please. Which one? Oh, cilantro, absolutely. All, all the greens are, but those are specifically very good. Parsley, cilantro, and uh, what's the other one? Just those two, right? I mean, th that are similar, parsley and Yeah, parsley and cilantro are very good for cleansing. Yes? Yeah, chlorella is also very good. Um, that's also a green plant. Uh, Yes. Right. It, that's correct. Yes. And any any form of chlorophyll will also help in binding those toxins and carrying them out of the body. Especially doing a, when you're doing a coffee enema, the the chlor the chlorophyll and the green juice uh, will help to bring those toxins out of the liver uh, on out the door. Yes. Uh, that you could, yeah, that would probably be a good idea. That way it's in your digestive tract. Right. Yeah, it'll go together. Exactly. Yes. Okay, yes. Uh, Sister Kathy has a question or a comment. Yes? Okay, it's on. Yes. Uh, I believe th I believe the dosage is between one and three three one and three teaspoons a day, but because my wife's infection was to the point where she was having pain and it was like really bad, uh, yeah, and she had a fever too. So uh, we had her taking uh, I think uh, about three tablespoons a day. Yeah, and it was just for I think she took it for five days just to clear everything and and then it was fine. Um, there was a brother. A couple years ago, and I don't remember I don't remember his name, but he bought us a colloidal machine. I did, can't remember the name of the brother, but anyways, we've been using it in our ministry in the Philippines, and it's been a blessing to many people. Uh, so if yeah, yeah, I anyways I don't remember his name, and I kind of lost contact with him. But uh, nevertheless, he had this really nice machine that he purchased for us and uh, donated that to our ministry, and we've been using it to produce our own colloidal silver which is antibiotic in nature. And we've helped people with flu, cough, uh, you know, fever, various things. And, and, and we've also used it for, uh, you can also infuse it into the lungs. There's a, uh, a nebulizer that you can inhale it with. Uh, yeah, you put just a couple drops in there and you nebulize it and you breathe it. And it helps the lungs, really good stuff. So uh, I've used it quite a few times myself, yes. Okay. 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 Uh huh. Okay. Oh, it's nettle, nettle, stinger nettle. Is that the one that stings your hands? Huh? Okay, I don't want to touch it because yeah, i I'm okay. Go ahead. Okay, put put the mic up to your mouth. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Yes. Yes. Right. Can you can you show that on the camera, honey? Can you put that on the camera? No, 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 no. Let let him let him hold it. Let him hold it, Daryl. No, you just let yeah, just put it in front of the camera. Stinger nettles. This is the herb, and uh, what do you what do you use it for? Congestion. Dif okay, for cleansing, yeah. for detoxifying the in body. Romania, everybody okay. Spring is very efficient. Okay, so they use this in Romania a lot. Okay, good. Now I'm going to tell you a story about that herb. Okay. Okay. That's it. 
That's the one right there. Yeah. Now, thank you. thank you so much. Uh, I, I will add to what George was sharing about this herb, the stinger nettle. In 1992, I was on my way to Costa Rica to distribute 70,000 pieces of literature in Spanish. And I was uh, traveling in a Ford truck with an overhead camper shell, and I was by myself. And I had spent two years as a missionary in Mexico, and now I was on my way to Central America. And uh, so when I was traveling, I reached Guatemala, and I was staying in the town. And uh, I met some people, and they said, oh, you can park your vehicle in front of our house. It's safe. And I said, oh, thank you so much. And in the morning, uh, a young girl brought me some food. And I was like, oh, thank you. And so I ate the food. And, and after I left, because I was traveling all the way to Costa Rica driving, took me eight days to cross Mexico and one week to cross Central American countries. Anyways, so while I was traveling, uh, that night I started, my stomach started just pain and, and I, I was having diarrhea. And make a long story short, I had amoebiasis or something so bad that I was defecating blood and pus, okay? It was really, really bad. And I, I prayed, I had golden seal, I had echinacea, I had charcoal, I had all these really, really good herbs with me. And I was taking teaspoons of them and large doses and nothing was affecting this thing that I was experiencing. And I was having 20 bowel movements a day, at least. I had to keep pulling over and pulling over. And I said, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen. I'll probably, if I die on the way, at least I'm on the way. And so I was determined I was going to make it to Costa Rica. And I did. At night, I would have sweats. And I was sweating profusely. And it, it was horrible. Bad experience. And, uh, and so I didn't know. I figured it must have been some food that I ate in Guatemala. Guatemala. Maybe it was the food that was prepared. I don't know. And so when I reached Costa Rica, I was in such excruciating body pain and so dehydrated. The, the Adventist brother who was my contact there, uh, where I parked my vehicle at their house, he said, oh, brother, uh, are you sick? And I said, oh, you don't know. I am so sick so sick. And I told him what happened. He said, oh, he said, come with me. And this brother was really into health. He knew all the herbs. He said, come on, let's go up to the mountain. We got in his car. We drove up to the mountains. And guess what herb we picked? Stinging nettles. We took it to his house. He put it in a, I'm sorry? Yeah, we use gloves to pick it because it stings your hands. I don't know. Does it sting your hands? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, if you touch it here, it's, it doesn't sting your hands. But I remember he had me put on gloves. We put on gloves, and we were picking these plants. And he said, this is the medicine you need. And we took it to his house. We put it in the blender, and he blended it up. He said, drink this. In 24 hours, all symptoms of my sickness was completely gone. Fever. 20 bowel movements a day with pus and blood, all gone by drinking that herb right there. Very powerful, powerful medicine. In fact, it's been about, see, that was 1992. What is that, 28 years, something like that? It's been 28 years since I've seen that herb. Fresh, fresh. That's good stuff. That's powerful medicine. See, God put plants in nature for us to use when we get sick. That doesn't mean that you never go to the hospital when you have something like that. I should have gone, but I, I didn't. I, I just figured, well, I got herbs. I, maybe it'll go away. So I just kept on trucking on down to Costa Rica, and I made it. But anyways, yes. Okay. Yeah, right. Oh, good. Yeah. Right, so you were watering it, okay. Oh, praise the Lord. Let it grow. I think it grows about this tall, right? Yeah, I remember it. Yeah, so this was, this was a lifesaver. I mean, this is a fantastic herb, and it's just one of many herbs that can do amazing things. Yes, my love. Okay, question from the Internet. Yes? Whoop. 
Okay, heavy metal cleanse. I would do the cleanse that we've been talking about. Uh, how do we do a heavy metal cleanse? What do we recommend? Uh, definitely, I would uh, do a 10-day cleanse program, which is what we do. Um, you can do a five-day juice fast, uh, and then you can eat like one day of raw food, and you can do another four-day juice fast and eat one day of raw food, something like that. You can do a four-day juice fast, one day of raw food, then another four-day juice fast, one day of raw food. That's a total of 10 days. Basically, you want to fast eight days out of 10, okay? And you've got to do a lot of green juices. You've got to do some uh, colon detox stuff. We use uh, charcoal mixed with bentonite clay, pharmaceutical grade bentonite clay. We use psyllium seed, flax seed. Uh, we use a slippery elm. It's a combination of all these herbs. It goes into the intestine. It expands. It pulls all these toxins out. Um, and that's one way that you can cleanse the heavy metals out of the body, but it's the green juices and especially cilantro and parsley are good for removing heavy metals from the body. So definitely you want to drink lots of juice from those. In the Philippines, we buy a whole big bunch of parsley leaves and I get a whole thing of it and I just jam it through the Norwalk juicer and we get juice and I add it to the juices. And, it, and of course, coffee enemas, detoxifying the liver. Remember, these heavy metals go into the organs of the body. They go into the tissues. And the only way to get rid of that is through fasting, steam bath, cleansing the colon, cleansing the liver, cleansing the kidneys, just what we've been talking about in these lectures. So thank you for that question. And let me see if we got another one. How do we, how do we grit, get rid of a chalazion on the eyelid? Is that a, is that a sty, Harold? Uh, it says... Chalazion. I'm not sure what that is. If it's a sty, uh, you can put some colloidal silver on it or you can put uh, charcoal poultice, just a little tiny one. Um, you might have to put a bandage over the eye. That can help. If it's a sty, I'm not sure what a chalazion is. Uh, I'm assuming that's a sty. Uh, let's see here. Oh, how about blood pressure? What would be the best herb? Okay. Um, Juniper berries, I'm sorry, not, uh, hawthorn berries is good for the heart, good for circulation. Cayenne pepper, called the king of the herbs, and garlic. I would blend these with your green juices, and I would drink them fresh, and it will help to lower your blood pressure. But remember, what is the cause of high blood pressure? The kidneys are toxic. They're overloaded with toxins. That can raise your blood pressure. And also your arteries are clogged with atherosclerotic plaque, and otherwise known as cholesterol. And the way to get rid of that is through juice fasting and detoxifying the body, just what we've been talking about in this series of lectures. For the person who asked that question on Facebook tonight, I would encourage you to watch the, le the previous lectures listed on Seventh-day Sabbath Church uh, Facebook page, uh, and you will have more information there about how to get rid of high blood pressure. In fact, there's a video testimony of a lady, one of many, who has gone through the cleanse program, done the fasting and the juicing and the detox, and her blood pressure went from 160 over 89 down to 112 over 78 in just a matter of a few days. So that was a great question. Okay, so it looks like that covers all the questions. And uh, um, here's our contact information. Our YouTube channel is Restoration to Eden Ministry. We will be uploading these last few lectures to our YouTube channel. So if you subscribe, you'll get to watch them again there as well. And we'll have new material as the Lord uh, allows us to upload more things. So thank you so much, and God bless us, and happy Sabbath.